Thank you so much for attending our NWHM Presents Sundays at Home presentation of We Gather Together with author Denise Kiernan and moderator Kate Anderson Brower. My name is Liz Eberlein and I am the Education Programs Manager at the National Women's History Museum outside of Washington, DC. Founded in 1996, the National Women's History Museum is the nation's only women's history museum and the most recognized institution dedicated to uncovering, interpreting, and celebrating women's diverse contributions to society. A renowned leader in women's history education, the museum brings to life the countless untold stories of women throughout history, and serves as a space for all to inspire, experience, collaborate, and amplify women's impact past, present, and future. For nearly 25 years, we've served as the largest online cultural institution dedicated to US women's history, and we're excited that in the coming years, we'll finally have a physical home of our own in Washington, DC. In the meantime, we'll continue our important work sharing the powerful history of women in America. And we hope that after today's discussion, you'll find us on social media and join us in the important work of representation. The National Women's History Museum is offering virtual programs like this one on select Sundays each month. So if you enjoyed this program today, please continue to check our website for upcoming Sunday programming for the month of December. A few housekeeping notes. We are recording this presentation so that it can be available on our website following the event. Denise will also be answering questions, so please don't be shy. If you have a question, please click on the Ask a Question button at the bottom of your screen. If you're interested in purchasing Denise's book, there's a link on your screen that will take you directly to East City Books and the link to purchase the book. And now I'd like to introduce our speakers for today. Denise, Denise Kiernan is an author, journalist, and producer. Her last book, The Last Castle, was an instant New York Times bestseller in both hardcover and paperback, and was also a Wall Street Journal bestseller. Her previous title, The Girl of Atomic City, is a New York Times, Los Angeles Times, and NPR bestseller, and has been published in multiple languages. She has also worked in television, serving as head writer for ABC's Who Wants to Be a Millionaire during its Emmy award-winning first season, and has produced for media outlets such as ESPN and MSNBC, as well as for independent productions. She's currently living in North Carolina. Our moderator for this afternoon is Kate Anderson Brower. Kate is the author of the number one New York Times bestseller, The Residents and First Women, also a New York Times bestseller, as well as Team of Five and First in Line. She is a CNN contributor, and she was the historical consultant on CNN's First Lady series. She covered the Obama administration for Bloomberg News and is also a former CBS News staffer and Fox News producer. Kate has written for the New York Times, Vanity Fair, and the Washington Post, and she lives outside of Washington, D.C. with her husband, their three young children, and their Wheaton Terrier. So please help me in welcoming our guest for this afternoon. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Liz. We'll see, we'll see Liz back again at the end. Thank you so much to the National Women's History Museum. And hi, Kate. Hi, Kate. I'm sorry. Okay, so I feel like I should tell everybody that we were um, that we were actually talking in the green room before this started. I was talking about how I've had all my all my uh, programs so far. I've been doing this for a couple of weeks now. Have gone off without a hitch, and and now we're having. I should have just not said a word because things are getting really really nutty now. Um, and it, it, but you know what? This is, this is pretty, we're all gonna we're all gonna hang through there. The only other thing I would say is, um, Kate, if you have another computer open and logged on to this, that could um, that sometimes causes a feedback issue. Okay. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, I'll run my I'll just chit chat. Um, I also want to thank East City Bookshop, uh, which is offering uh, copies of my book uh, during this event and after this event. Uh, you can actually get signed copies, um, and we have these love. How is that possible? Because I'm here. Lovely little, um, lovely little signed book plates. Um, so you can have, you know, signed copies to give as gifts, or just keep for yourself. So that little button down there helps you support 
uh, an independent bookstore. And goodness knows right now, so many independent businesses, including bookstores, uh, need our support. So uh, there we go. How's it going over there, Kate? Um, it is going very well. I think, uh, can you hear me and pay? Yeah. Okay, good. I think I might have had it open on two screens. I take complete blame for this. Um, so no, Denise and I have known each other for a long time and I'm really excited to do this today because uh, I think the book is fascinating, um, engaging, and it's the kind of nonfiction that reads like fiction and really draws you in. And also it's unique because it covers this huge swath of history. I mean, it's not focused on this one, it's a one event, I mean, talking about the theme of gratitude and Thanksgiving. Um, but I like the way that you bring the reader through, you know, you've got the Civil War up until, you know, the, the 1960s talking about, you know, how Malcolm X and other civil rights leaders um, and Native Americans were affected, obviously, by the way the narrative of Thanksgiving was shaped. Um, so I, I'm really excited to, to talk about it and also to talk about the woman behind Thanksgiving as we as we know it today because I had no idea um, and so I guess I I wanted to talk to you and I don't think we've ever spoken about this what made you want to write this book and get into this theme of gratitude which could not come at a better time right in the critical period yeah. um, you know what 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 made you want to tackle Thanksgiving you know it's interesting um, that and, and at your, your writers will we get asked this all the time, sort of like, why did you do this book? How did you come across this, this topic? And sometimes it's a really easy answer. Uh, with Girls of Atomic City, it was literally, literally a photograph that I saw. Um, with this, I had come across Sarah Josepha Hale's story a while ago, and I don't even remember how. I think I was researching another book and came across uh, this um, this amazing this amazing woman who ended up being so instrumental in the creation of uh, National Day of Thanks, but I don't really write bio straightforward biographies, um, so I just sort of put her uh, aside. I put her in my idea file. I have massive idea files where I keep all sorts of things that you know grab my attention, um, and then I you know. In recent years, I've become really interested in the concept of gratitude and uh, really interested in a lot of the research that's been done in the last decade or so about the importance of gratitude, the impact of, of gratitude on your mental well-being, your physical well-being, your, your emotional health. And, and, and then I thought about it, it's so important to have a... a to be able to embrace gratitude when things are not going well. Um, and so I thought about, you know, Hale and how many struggles she faced. And I thought about um, uh, Lincoln and how, you know, th this holiday, this National Day of Thanks came together in the middle of the Civil War. I mean, you want to talk about a time when people did not want to come together. Um, and then, the, but the gratitude piece to me sort of became the linchpin for all of this and became a, a way into the story, if you know what I mean. You know, we're, we're always looking, like, what way do I want to get into the story? There's so many different ways to tell stories. And so it was the intersection of events. Because a lot of times as a writer, I find the intersection of events and topics as compelling or sometimes even more compelling than the individual events and people themselves. And so Hale's overlapping, you know, with Abraham Lincoln and the Civil War and this gratitude piece behind it. That's that's how it all sort of started to come together for me. And, you know, I also, I, I love Thanksgiving. <laughs> I, I do. I love Thanksgiving. I actually start the book off um, trying to have Thanksgiving. <laughs> and then in, in another country. Um, but that's sort of how I, that's sort of how I came to it. And that's a very it's a more roundabout way than um, some of my other books have come together. It, it was definitely a more circuitous route to get to this. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Did you find it was an easy concept to get your publisher on board with? Because, you know, they can be fickle. Yes, it can. I mean, they can they can be because, you know, we're all we're all trying to, we're all trying to figure out what's going to work mm -hmm. with the reading public. 
Um, but there was a real, there was a very positive response to um, not just, well, as with you, to Hale's story uh, initially, just because she's so, she she's, under underknown, I like to call her underknown. Um, she's uh, she's underreported and undercovered, and uh, the whole civil war aspect was also really um, appealing to the publisher, and 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 they sort of got the whole the the gratitude link too. So actually, despite the fact that I was doing a book that was a little bit different than some of my prior ones, um, you know, they they were on board and. I talk sometimes about trying to find lenses as a way to kind of focus in on bigger stories. Like, you know, for the girls, for the girls of Atomic City, it was, um, you know, looking at the the dawn of the nuclear age through this little lens of this group of of young women in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and then with um, then with the Last Castle. It was kind of looking at when the Gilded Age turned to the Industrial Age and, and that mm -hmm. American culture, but looking at that through the lens of the largest house in the country, Biltmore Estate. So for me, this one is really kind of a biography of um, a biography of American culture in a way, and sort of looking at the evolution of American culture through the lens of giving thanks. So that's how that kind of came together. Um, and can you talk a little bit about who Sarah Josepha Hale was, why why she matters, and why we haven't heard about her? Because, you know, I I feel like, I, you know, I like to think of myself as a feminist, and I went to a sister school, right? And I know that you are a feminist also, but she's somebody who has not broken through in the way that so many other, uh, uh, you know, she's certainly not a Susan B. Anthony level um, woman. Right. I'm wondering why. You know, um, that's a it's a great question, and I often find myself asking this, uh, asking myself this question about so many things. And I think, you know, and a lot of times, and I've probably talked about this with you before. People will say, "Oh, so you do you just write women's history?" And I always say, "Yeah, I don't write women's history." Mm -hmm. I write history, and mm -hmm. there are a lot of women in it, and sometimes just putting them back in because they, they they were always there. Um, but so Sarah Sarah Josepha Hale was a a widowed mother of five mm -hmm. living in the in the early nineteenth century, in the, and it, she became despite a lack of the, the kind of education we all um, take for granted. Uh, one of the most influential magazine editors of the 19th century. And uh, she was she was doing her, she constantly did her own writing. She wrote books, she wrote poems, she anthologized the writing of other people, including a lot of women. Um, she published uh, a lot of folks uh, who were quite well known now, but who were not well known at the time. And I'll come back to one of my favorite anecdotes in a second about that. Um, but uh, one of her life, she had a couple lifelong passions. One was uh, education for young women, uh, especially since she herself did not um, you know, get to benefit from that. She thought it was very important that, uh, that everybody get a chance at mm -hmm. education. And uh, she felt very lucky that she grew up in a house where books were worshiped um, and that she was encouraged to read and read extensively. Uh, her husband, who she lost uh, far too early in their marriage, they used to have study hour together at night between eight and 10, which I thought was great. They would maybe talk about botany or French or, or whatever books they were reading. And so this lifelong love of books, when she was um, offered the opportunity to edit an influential ladies magazine, as they were called. Um, she really wanted to make sure that there was original writing in it, which was very different. Back then, they talked about people being scissors editors. You basically cut out stories from other publications and almost curate them for your own publication. She wanted original works. Um, lots of women wrote for her. 
Uh, and then in, in addition to this, this obsession with education and books, um, she was, uh, she, she loved Thanksgiving and Thanksgiving, you know, at the time was kind of moved all over the calendar. You know, um, it was celebrated at different times each year and often in different, at different times in different states. Governors would often uh, declare them, um, you know, so Massachusetts might have their fall Thanksgiving, uh, you know, in November and, you know, Connecticut might have theirs in December. And there were other Thanksgivings for other occasions, uh, you know, for battle victories, you know, during the war, all these sorts of things. And she wanted everybody to come together to have Thanksgiving on the same day throughout the country. And so this became one of her one of her campaigns. And she, uh, she first time she wrote extensively about Thanksgiving was in her 1827 novel, uh, Northwood. And the attention this novel got is one of the things that led to her being offered a position as an editor. She writes a description of Thanksgiving that is, you know, s sort of akin to like really early decadent indulgent food writing. Um, and, you know, she would use her magazine as a pulpit in her editor's chair to write about the importance of a national day of thanks. Um, and, you know, then she eventually started, and we'll get into that in a second, she started, you know, campaigning with governors and, and ambassadors, and the heads of territories, and eventually presidents to declare a single day of national thanks throughout the country and that that day should be the same day every year for year after, you know, year after year. And, you know, one of the reasons you asked, you know, why we don't know more about her, you know, I think part of it is, um, and it's always hard to, to say why we learn about some people and why we don't learn about others. Um, she, you know, she wasn't, as much as she campaigned for uh, women's education and, uh, you know, it, the, the right to an education, she was not a uh, part of the suffrage movement. She didn't mm -hmm. want to, she didn't want to be a part of the suffrage movement. That wasn't her, that wasn't her thing. And she didn't write about it a lot in the magazine either. Mm -hmm. um, so the right to an education was something she was into, but the women's right for the vote was certainly not a fight of hers. And, um, you know, and it's one of the things I, I like about, you know, her or any person in history, they're all very complicated, you know, layered people um and you know she could have used her you know she could have used her magazine as a as a pulpit to promote that as well um how that would have gone over with her readers might have been a concern i don't know she had certainly seen people uh lose jobs for being too outspoken and you know she had a, she had a family to a family to raise i don't know this is one of those times when you sort of wish you know, she left a lot of writing behind, but it's one of those times where you wish you could just travel back in time and sit down and have a cup of coffee and say, seriously, what was what what was going on? Um, but the the imp the impact she had on so many writers was really just just spectacular. What did um, what was President Lincoln's you know uh, reaction to her? I mean, did she walk into the White House? Because there are these wonderful scenes of people just right walking into the White House oh, sure. yeah. with him during the Civil War, and and I'm wondering if he seized upon this be, because of the moment in history that we were in. Right, it was a critical time to bring the country together. It really was, and. Um, I think, I mean, because she started with, you know, she went through Taylor and Pierce mm -hmm. and uh, Fillmore and Buchanan, and nobody got on board with this National Day of Thanks. And she would constantly put in her magazine, um, every, you know, every time, every year, though, she would talk about which states had gotten on board. Well, you know, Ohio has been doing it with us for the last, you know, and, mm -hmm. and she was constantly talking about how, how well it was going. Um, when it, it came to Lincoln, I mean, it's it's interesting because I mean, of all the presidents she approached, it was 1863. He's in the middle of the Civil War. They just had, you know, the, the horrible, horrible um, Battle of Gettysburg, you know, had, had happened that summer, um, you know. And I do think he was looking for any kind of. Re he was all about preserving the Union, as was she. 
So, I mean, she was the daughter of a Revolutionary War veteran, and he was in, her father was injured fighting in the Revolutionary War. Mm-hmm. She had grown up with every president from Washington, you know, forward, and she wanted, she saw the Union coming apart. Mm-hmm. So I think when she wrote that letter to Lincoln asking him to proclaim a National Day of Thanks, she also wrote uh, William Seward, his Secretary of State. Mm-hmm. And that, I think, was very, very smart. Um, in in Seward's uh, autobiography, he talks about actually going into um, going into Lincoln's office and saying, you know, these states are saying we're trying to take away their rights, and you know, I have another right we can take away from them. And uh, mm-hmm. Lincoln said, which one now? And he goes, the right to declare Thanksgiving, the right to proclaim Thanksgiving, and. Uh, Lincoln got on board, and it, it, it's interesting to me, after all these years of her trying to make this happen, I mean, he responded, it was within just a, it was within just a couple weeks um, that, that he went ahead and, and, and made this proclamation for a National Day of Thanks that was going to take place, actually it's the same date as this year, it was uh, the 26th of November, um, and was going to take place the, um, you know, a week after Gettysburg. Wow. And, and uh, you know, it was it was a very, very trying time. And again, the idea of coming together. I love the idea of like in the movie version of this, she totally walks into his office. And, of course. Know, I mean, that's what I'm right. That has to happen. Uh, but what's interesting is um, her daughter, uh, her daughter's brother-in-law was a general hunter who was very close very close with Lincoln. If if Hale had wanted to to go meet Lincoln in in the White House, he could have, she totally could have via her her son-in-law. And, uh, you know, it's, again, in the movie version, that's how Mm -hmm. it happened, I think. I don't want to skip ahead to the, I, I mean, I'm really interested in talking to you about how you explore Thanksgiving without this kind of murky, very, it's a very controversial holiday, right? And it has become, um, you know, countless communities have wanted to be recognized. And you write about this in the book quite a bit for their contribution to the American story, right? And then there was this fight over when was the first Thanksgiving? I mean, can you get into the, there's like, it's a loaded holiday politically. Sure. Um, and, you know, famously what Malcolm X said, Plymouth Rock landed on us. Right. We didn't. Yeah. We, these are not our relatives. Um, and so how did you tackle that in writing about this book and wanting to kind of it's not romanticizing Thanksgiving, yeah. actually giving the because I feel like you really do get into the conflicts around it. And, you know, it, it, a lot of schools now are struggling with how to to talk about Thanksgiving. They, they, they are, and uh, some are coming along, some aren't. Um, I think part of the challenge, and you know, for me, um, what, was, what was really interesting, and there was, a, there was a point at which, because this in and of itself is a fascinating Thanksgiving story that happens to be 100% true, and it doesn't require um, the, 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 the not so great and also not so true yeah. lessons that we usually trot out during the year. So there was a part of me that thought I'm going to write this book without even mentioning, um, you know, 1621 and the pilgrims and everything. But then I thought it, it, it the, I, how that came into the narrative was also kind of interesting just from a, from the perspective of how kind of cultures evolve when, Sarah Josepha Hale wrote Lincoln and these other presidents. She was not she was not seeking to commemorate any specific event at mm-hmm. all. That wasn't she didn't write that. Um, she didn't mention that in her letter in the proclamations. You know, Lincoln didn't Lincoln never mentioned we're doing this because, you know, there was this event in 1621. That just wasn't that yeah, just wasn't a part of it. That's not the way we grew up at all. No, not the way at all. Yeah, it's fascinating. And what's interesting is there were so many, um, you know, there were so there were at at some point, and I go into this, um, I go into this in the book, a romanticization of the early uh, of the relationships between the the pilgrims and the indigenous peoples of this continent. 
began to work its way into um, these fictionalized versions began to work their way into women's magazines and, mm -hmm. and children's magazines. And one of the more interesting articles I came across in my research was, was a children's magazine that talked about this mm -hmm. meal and uh, in that was not, but it was not, it was not accurate. And uh, so there was no, I mean, there's, we have so little, uh, we have so little evidence. Uh, was there a meal between the Wampanoag and um, pilgrims in 1621? Yes. Was it declared by anyone at the time to be a Thanksgiving or were the Wampanoag, you know, invited? No, they weren't. Um, and no, it wasn't declared to be that. And there had been other, you know, uh, similar celebrations on the continent uh, prior to that and after that. But at some point, you know, in the, especially in the 20th century, the idea of what was first and what was going to be, um, you know, commemorated just kind of, it, it sort of grew. Um, and then when you, you know, when you take into account so many of the things that, that happened to the original occupants of this land um, as a result of the newcomers, uh, you know, we don't, we don't, it, it starts to feel exploitive to keep trotting out that, to keep trotting out that story. But what yeah. I think part of the issue is, and I'm not, I am not the first person to, I'm not the first person to bring this to light. A lot of other people have, have, you know, have debunked that aspect of um, the holiday, you know, before me. Um, I think part of the challenge is that we're presenting what is essentially a, a very difficult uh, story and moment in history to seven and eight year olds. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and mm -hmm. um, <laughs> having that, uh, you know, having that happen, it's not like they get the full story, like in AP history in high school, nobody goes back to talk about Thanksgiving anymore. And so I feel like that's why year after year, you always have, you know, these stories coming out about like, you know, we've got to kind of switch mm -hmm. this. And, and, and one of the things that I, wanted to get across in the book was that I, I show how this holiday has evolved from like harvest festivals and, you know, Thanksgivings in England from, for, you know, beating the Spanish Armada to Thanksgivings in the colonies for the repeal of the stamp tax to, you know, a conflation of all those things to what we know Thanksgiving to be today. And, you know, the holiday can keep evolving. I mean, it can, it can, it, you know, now we have Giving Tuesday. There are a lot of very nice things that have come, that have come to pass. Um, there's nothing to say this can't, like, we can't, as a culture, cause, you know, because I want to feel good about Thanksgiving, you know, and, and make this, it's beautiful, the idea of having a, a holiday about saying thank you. That's, that's wonderful, powerful stuff. Um, you know, the holiday can be a reflection of, you know, as Lincoln said, you know, the better angels of our nature. It can, it can really... It could really evolve to be, um, you know, something that really does reflect uh, the best of the best of American culture. I really do think that. But it was interesting for me to just watch how, watch how something like a holiday yeah. starts and then changes and evolves, and the role the media played in that, and the role that um, obviously uh, commercial interests yeah. and shopping played in that. Um, so that to me, that idea, and, and, you know, I do talk about this book as sort of the biography of an idea, um, yeah. kind of looking at how that grew and changed, I thought was, um, I thought was kind of, I, I thought it was interesting. It but is. You can get topics that are interesting because you're there in your life for so long, you know. I, right. How long did you end up researching and, and working on this book all told? You know, I don't know. I, I know. know. I, I know. You know, you know what it's like. It's like. Right. You start like I came across Hale a while ago, really? and every once in a while we just start, you know, looking into her. And then I've always um, I've read a lot about Lincoln. I like reading about Lincoln. Mm -hmm. um, then the gratitude piece was the last piece, and that's the one that made me want to kind of do the book the way that I did it. Um, and but what's so funny is. At, when we do these, because when you conceive of a book or you think you have a book idea and then you propose it and then you edit it and then you revise it, by the time the book is out, it's very different than the world in which you sort of conceived of it. But wow, did the world change <laughs> between the time I had conceived of this book 
Um, and then it, you know, it, it landed on, on bookshelves, you know, a week or so ago. And, you know, when we were going back through like the final edits and everything, there's a, um, you know, there's a section on Thanksgiving during World War One and during the Spanish flu. And that read very differently, you know, the, and it, 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 it was very interesting to watch how different this book felt um, going into the production of the book as opposed to when, you know, I first started thinking about it for sure. Which um, which president do you think was really at the forefront? Because I was surprised. I mean, there were some things, so, some um, words that Reagan had said that were surprisingly, I thought, modern. Right? I was. Uh, he's the only guy. He's the only president in his um, Thanksgiving proclamation. He's the only one who mentioned hail. He's the only one who's ever mentioned hail. And uh, which also seems kind of, but it just sh shows you how, you know, these things kind of go in and out of, in and out of the culture and, and gain, gain strength or not. Yeah. Um, but I would have thought like after he did it, maybe the subsequent, you know, right. but they didn't. <laughs> it's right. so, so interesting to me. Yeah. Yeah, you would think that they would go back and kind of crib from each other's Thanksgiving, you know, speeches or and just not, or not. Maybe it's maybe it's well if he said I'm not I don't want to look like I'm that's that's true. That's true. My own, yeah. I don't know. I do feel like this is the perfect book though to make into a young readers edition or a children's book because there is a way to tell this story to young kids to kind of um not romanticize it quite as much i mean growing up right all we knew about thanksgiving was the pilgrims and the native americans and it was all great and they just ate together yeah. and it's just so um it's so much more nuanced than that and and complicated and i do wonder i do think it would be a great service actually to to kids to have to have a, a children's edition of this book and we are and we are and we are going to um, um, yes, we are going to. Um, it to me, she is such a. It's such a great tale of of tenacity, yes, and, and just being determined. And in addition to this campaign for you know a National Day of Thanks, she was constantly raising money for people. And this was not a like when her husband died, she was having trouble, you know and uh you know making ends meet it was it was a, it was a de it was something that was a concern for her so she wasn't some you know supremely wealthy woman who was you know uh editing a magazine on the side for fun um she needed you know she needed an income yet she still used her her influence to bring attention to the widows of of men who had been lost at sea building libraries um, you know, the women's education, exercise for young boys and girls, um, what to read. I mean, in today's, in today's language, you would call her, she would be an influencer, right? <laughs> you know, these, these people who have like a million Instagram followers or whatever, but she wasn't often, you know, she wasn't just using her, her magazine, Godies was one of the, if not the most read, um, you know, women's magazine in the 19th century, one of the most mm -hmm. read and at, at certain times. Absolutely. It's its circulation was, uh, you know, beyond anybody else's. And there was this huge pass along readership back then because um, subscriptions weren't within yeah. reach for everyone. So you'd read your copy and then you'd give it to your neighbor and she'd give it to somebody. So the number of eyeballs that were getting on her words was quite impressive. And you know, she raised money for things by, um, you know, she was a big believer in the power of small. And she would put, she would say to her readers, you know, if we each just gave 25 cents, we would be able to raise X. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, that's, that's a, you hear that talk uh, today still. Um, you know, so she wasn't always just using her influence, uh, her role as an influencer to sell copies of her magazine. She was often using it to raise money for other people, to help other people. And that I think is, uh, that I think is quite impressive and quite inspirational. Um, she wasn't she, a self promoter though. I mean, do you think that's yeah. part of it? To, to, to insert yourself in the history, you have right. to be aware of your legacy and you have to be 
a bit of a self promoter. I mean, these women, Susan B. Anthony, all the women that we know of fought really hard to be remembered. And maybe it was because she was mo modest or, you know, her personality just didn't lend itself to kind of self aggrandizement. That's a very good, that's actually a very good, um, that's a very good point. I mean, she, she was not the kind of person who was, you know, going to go give a speech somewhere. Like she supported women's uh, education um, via writing letters to people who could actually make change happen. But she was never going to go out and give a, a speech about that. You know, mm -hmm. she didn't, she wasn't the kind of person who was, you know, I'm here to tell you about X, Y, or Z. Um, and even in her magazine, you know, she had her little, she called herself the editress. She had her, you know, her column, but she was constantly ceding, um, you know, space over to other voices. A lot of them new voices. Um, and a lot, and a, a lot of men too. One of my favorite, um, I love how she, she's, she's sort of like a, one person who was talking to me about the book said she was like the Forrest Gump of the 19th century, because you realize she had these yeah. relationships and, and intersected with so many interesting people and events. Um, <laughs> she was early on uh, in one of her review sections or sort of what to read, she published, um, uh, they published a, a review of sorts of a very, very early work of a, of a young writer. And uh, in this in this review, she says something along the lines of, you know, his prose is a little boyish and he definitely, you know, needs to mature or whatever. But, you know, there are signs of genius and, you know, could end up being no less, a, you know, no less a poet than Shelley, blah, blah, blah. Then she gets a letter from her son, David, who's going to West Point. And it turns out this young writer was actually a classmate of her son, David, at West Point. And so David writes his mother and he says, you know, I, I showed, you know, I showed the, the citation in the magazine to my classmate, Edgar, Alan Poe. <laughs> um, and, and so this is, this begins like a lifelong writer editor relationship between Hale and Poe that lasted till the end of his to the end of his life. And his last short story, Malona Tata, was in um, Godi's magazine. Uh, the Cask of Amontillado was first published in there. And, and yeah, and it's so funny. I think about that and I think about these these women looking at, you know, dress patterns and, and recipes and <laughs> right. physical um, exercise for your children and then somebody getting walled up in a crypt, you know? <laughs> <laughs> just start to imagine them going, oh. <laughs> um, so, it's definitely not women's magazine reading. You don't think of Edgar Allan Poe as, you know, well, light. I love that she, you know, I love that she did that. They were quite, you yeah. know, they remained close to with him and his and his family um, till the end of his life. She published, you know, Nathaniel Hawthorne, Washington Irving, Ralph, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Um, Harriet Beecher Stowe, uh, you know, lots of people before they were, you know, big names. And then she would, you know, she put together these big anthologies of um, like the Ladies' Wreath, uh, which was, you know, female poets. Hmm. And so she was constantly putting other people's work out there as well. And that is that kind of generosity of, of spirit and using your influence in that way. I, it's really, I, I, it's just, it's really, and it's really inspiring, and it's true. So mm -hmm. to think of all those, all that influence that she had, and it kind of makes sense when you look at the things she was interested in that she would want a national day of thanks, that she would want a day when everybody came together at the same time to say thank you. Um, but it, but if you look at her as a whole, I mean, it's just one of the like amazing, you know, amazing things that she, that she has done. Um, so well, somebody you should know, uh, somebody wrote here, Courtney McKinney wrote, my six year old daughter is here with me. And she just learned about uh, the young readers edition. She's a big fan. She's so excited to hear that there's going to be a young readers edition. So I think it's oh, really yeah. good for, for kids. And I have a couple kids this age too. It's like, to, to know this story. And they're a lot smarter than we think and oh, ready yeah. to hear a nuanced story. I mean, um, what do you, what does gratitude mean to you and why, and what did it mean to Sarah? I mean, what, what was it? She had a tough life, as you said. Yeah. I, and I, you know, one of the more interesting things that I 
learned about reading. Um, I mean, I, I was before gratitude was going to be a part of this book. It was something that I would just look into on my own because I, I, I think it's a very interesting, um, it's just, it's just a personal interest of mine, uh, having a gratitude practice and a gratitude journal and all that sort of stuff. Um, when, what's interesting is how much hard science there is now, um, on a neurological level, uh, mm -hmm. looking at the effect of that kind of gratitude, um, expressing gratitude, sometimes not even directly to a, a person. You can even write it in a letter. It, it's just sort of embodying that. Um, it's very personal. What you would have extreme gratitude for um, would be different from what I would. Um, so it's, it's, it's very personal, that effect. But the one thing that they're also, um, they've also come to see, and I, I think this is something she was, Hale was embodying without even realizing it, is that uh, the impact of gratitude on your well being is incredibly important during difficult times. It's almost amplified when the thing, it, it really improves the resilience of the human spirit if you can manage to find something to say thank you for, to be grateful for, when you're looking around and it feels like it's really hard to find something to be, to be grateful for. So, um, you know, in, in Hale's case, you know, lost lost her mother and her sister uh, at the same time, had an older brother lost at sea, um, lost her father shortly after her wedding, lost her husband, surprisingly, uh, to, you know, pneumonia, um, right before their fifth child was going to be born. Mm -hmm. um, and again, as she kept working and, and, and promoting these ideas of her, it, you know, as you can see, and you can see in the book, it's not like she was putting these ideas out there and everybody said, yeah, we'll get right on that. Mm -hmm. it didn't. I mean, she kept, but she kept at it and she kept at it and she kept at it. And, you know, so being great and, and, you know, 2020 has, you know, taught me a lot of, about trying to be thankful. And, you know, honestly, in a sense, this is sort of like the the best year to really pare down and hone in on the essence of Thanksgiving, of giving, of just coming together on the same day and giving thanks for whatever you have. Because honestly, like roof over your head and food on your table and you're not, and you, you have your health, you have hit the jackpot mm -hmm. in life. Um, and you know, there, there are a lot of folks who don't have that right now. And so to be able to say thank you for it um, in your own life, I think is it, 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 it's good for you. It's good for your spirit. So that's, you know, that's kind of where it is. That's sort of where I am with it. Um, you know, I'm going to miss, I'm going to miss everybody. I usually, Thanksgiving's a big deal in this house. We have a huge meal and which we're still going to have, but my husband and I are apparently going to be eating it for like four weeks. Um, and then the Saturday after I have a big uh, leftover party uh, and I have friends come over, you know, everybody drops in whenever they feel like it. I put the tree up. You can hang, kids can hang a horn, ornament on the tree and we all just hang out and you know, none of that, None of that's happening this year. Well, you know what people are doing, and I, I'm sure you're noticing this down in North Carolina, the trees are going up a lot earlier. Yes. There's a resilience to this COVID horror show, which I think we're yes. seeing, right? There's this need to celebrate. And we yes. see, it's, insp it's, it's inspiring to see what people are, yes. are coming up with. I, I love seeing that. And you know, a lot of times I'm running around so much um, oh, good. I see somebody entered a, entered a question. If you guys have any questions, because we're going to start that shortly, you can just put them in the ask a question section. Um, you know, it's inspiring to see people finding ways to, um, so in some cases, help others. In some cases, just sort of keep a smile on on their face and maybe somebody mm -hmm. else's. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and I'm usually running around so much that weekend with, ever, with whomever right. is physically in my house. I don't always get a chance to. Uh, I don't always get a chance to connect with people um, I'd like to. So I'm also going to just kind of shift from obligation to intention this year, and really think about who I want to connect with that weekend, and and ideally have some good some good quality conversations.
Take that a lot. And, and spend less money and time coming up with a Christmas list or a Hanukkah list. You know, yeah. the, the commercialism of these yeah. holidays. That's the great thing about Thanksgiving, right? Is that it's not about gifts and money. And, and I'm trying to, at least in my family, make sure you have enough gifts. Yeah. You, know, so that we're, you know, it's just ridiculous. Yeah. I, I hate that part of it. But so um, we are at the, what, 148 mark. Do you want to talk about the Young Readers edition a little let's bit? Look at some of the, let's look at some yeah. of the questions. So one of the questions is, can you tell us more about the Young Readers edition? Oh, okay. Yes, then we will talk about it. Yes. Um, so it's not going to be out until... Um, probably about two, about two years, because this book just came out um, and they, they stagger things. Um, so uh, if you want, so basically they're actually gonna be, there's going to be a picture book for very young and then there's gonna be a young reader's edition um, so that you can do a family read. So, you know, mom and dad can read, you know, this guy and then, um, you know, middle schoolers can read the young reader's edition and then there will be a, a picture book for kids. Um, all information about what I'm doing and uh, my books and when they come out and when I give talks is all on my um, all on my website and I can just uh, um, and I keep a pretty um, I have a mailing list I write like maybe once a month I don't really write that often because um, I know I don't like getting a ton of uh, ton of stuff um, and, uh, but I do keep people up to date on things like that when books are coming out. Um, and I will have information on the Young Readers Edition and the picture book on my website for sure. Um, this question I have to ask, because I had no idea that you worked on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. Uh, <laughs> tell us just one thing. So wait, was that when Regis was? Oh yeah, the first year when it went insane. So what yeah. What was that like? I mean, you can tell us more than one thing if you'd like. Well, I, I'm well, happy. It was, um, so I was the head writer uh, during that first crazy, insane season when it was on like every night of the week. Yeah. Not what we thought it was initially going to be. Um, it just, it was, we literally, it was like you were on a rocket ship and, you know, it was supposed to be hired for a short amount of time and it was going to be on like, you know, once a week or on the weekends or something. And then suddenly it was, you know, how many of these things could we do? So I oversaw a team of writers and researchers and they would put, um, you know, I'd give suggestions for like topic areas for questions and then I'd review people's questions and they'd go through a vetting process. And then I put them in order from one to 15. And then I would go over that um, with, uh, I would go over that with uh, the executive producer and uh, then I would go to the studio and I would brief and we'd get in arguments like that's not a number seven. That's a number four. I'm like, no, where you grow up, that was a number four. I had no idea. That's totally a number seven. Um, and uh, but uh, and then I'd go in the studios at night and brief Regis every night before the taping. What, so, so what was Regis like? He's he was he was he was lovely. I mean, we weren't like pals or anything, but just yeah. like a consummate professional, just so sharp, so easy to deal with, um, so polite, um, always called his wife every night from, from the taping. Joy. Um, Joy. 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 Called Joy. Mm -hmm. um, and he also, you know, you want to talk about somebody who worked. He was doing Regis and Kathy Lee in the morning. Then he was doing millionaire tapings at night. And we often went, because what you saw was an hour, but people were allowed to have as much time as they, tapings were often like four, sometimes four hours long. And then at a certain point during that, he was filling in on top of those two responsibilities. He was filling in for Letterman because Letterman had like quadruple bypass surgery or something. So he was, I, I don't, I, I, he was amazing. I mean, he did, he really, really, really worked. I was, I was sad. I was, you know, I, I was sad uh, when I heard about his passing. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, the funnier thing was we had no idea. It was such a security issue. Um, we had uh, the whole thing was like, you know, questions could not get out. Like even other people who worked on the show, nobody was allowed to come in the writer's room. Nobody mm -hmm. was allowed to come in the writer's room. And it got to the point where we couldn't figure out how we were supposed to dispose of the trash, the paper <laughs> trash, because the paper trash might have hints about what a question might be. So for a while, there were just these 
just mountains <laughs> of paper in the writer's room because they hadn't figured out yet how we were going to safely and securely get rid of that of uh, of the paper trash without like giving away questions it was great it was crazy it was great though i met so many wonderful so many wonderful yeah. people what an amazing thing and like the, the i'm sure it was locked with security guards outside the writer's room right at night oh, yeah, with <laughs> and all that. Um, so you created an official guide to zoom's giving complete I with did. Zoom background did. and conversation starter cards if you're preparing for your zoom's giving there's a you can check it out on your website um can you talk a little bit about what zoom's giving is i mean i know it's all getting together right that's my sense of it mm -hmm. but how can you make it more than just like an awkward facetime call that lasts 10 minutes and you say goodbye right so i think part of it is really um getting back to those key elements of, of of giving thanks so i do have um quote cards that are uh from the book and also from people in the book like Frederick Douglass and um, Eli Wiesel and um, Epictetus, you know, philosophers about mm -hmm. gratitude and giving thanks and the importance of that. And, you know, they're the kinds of things like if you go to this site, it's all just, you know, kind of free for you to do whatever you want. You can print those up and email them to the people you're going to be Zooming with. Yeah. Um, you could, you know, print them up and have them, you know, at, as place settings if you're having a couple people, you know, fam close family members over. I also did uh, conversation starters um, that you can, you know, download and send around ahead of time or keep yourself. And then, um, you know, having the, the I, there are three um, and they're high res uh, Zoom backgrounds that are seasonal. Uh, that are Thanksgiving oh, and I love that. yeah so you can if you're going to be zooming with folks everybody likes to change up their background so there's information on you can download these wonderful high res and they are to the um, they're exactly the size they're supposed to be for a zoom background you can download those and I even give a little link about how to change your zoom background if you don't know how to do that yeah um, so it's all it's all just about and I'm hoping and I need to put this up there I'm hoping people will share with me sort of um, how their how their Thanksgiving went, um, you know, and how and how they how they did that because you know I think it's going to be I think we're going to get some really good and in, inspirational stories out of this year. I really do. Um, and this is a selfish question because I think you're a, a fantastic writer, and I I I would selfishly like to know the answer to this. How has um, what's happening now in our country in the world like affected? your next project, whatever that is. I know you've got the Young Readers Edition. I know you've got all that, but like, how are you thinking about? Oh, well, I actually, um, I already know, and I've already I've already started on my next project, okay. but a, a big chunk of my next project was supposed to be me on the road this past summer. Yeah. So that didn't happen. Um, so, you know, it's, it's um, you know, it makes you kind of, rethink and and pare down and and kind of shift i'll have to you know i'll make the best of it you know again you do a lot of it without being physically on the road i mean can you interview people on zoom there's an, there is a there is a road trip aspect to my yes you can you can do a ton nowadays um i mean i love going to archives and okay. like doing things but um a lot of things have been scanned online. Um, you can interview people like this. You can interview people over the phone. And I, I, I'm certainly doing all of that. There are many things I can avail myself of um, without being on the road. But an actual element of my next book is me on the road. So there's a personal thread in it that can't that can't be faked. So it might be. So I'm. I'm I, I don't know. Let's stop. I'm figuring it out. Don't stress me out. That's, that's like the worst question to ask a writer, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> what your next project is. But no, I think it's just interesting to see what people are interested in. And I, I always want to know what readers want to read. I mean, right now, what are people looking for? I think your book fits the bill in terms of, you know, providing really interesting insight into this incredibly famous, uh, you know, celebration, but also, let's work this into our everyday lives and not be yeah. always striving for more and not appreciating what we have. I think that's unique to American culture too. And I think, yeah. you, might, you know, 
never being satisfied. Yeah, it's a state of, I mean, Thanksgiving really is a, it really is a, a state of mind and one that we could be embracing, you know, um, embracing throughout. Yeah, I hope, I hope. And you do a great job in the book too of not getting too political. I think it's just really a breath of fresh air. No one wants to kind of, I think people are looking for an escape too. And I think the way that you've written about, about Thanksgiving and about Sarah's getting knocked down and then back up again and like, you know, getting rejected as we all have. Yeah. I mean, it, it, is, it is a true, it's a 100% true story. It's a, a, a key part of American history. And, um, oh, there's a, wait, we, uh, I'm getting from my husband. There is a six year old's question here. We have oh. to answer that question. Yeah. Come on. Um, I'm sorry, we're, good. we're doing it right now. Oh yeah, my six-year-old wants to know if you can estimate about how many letters Sarah uh, Josepha Hale wrote about different issues she cared about over the course of her life. Wow, that's oh, a great question. This my is God. my six-year-old. That's a good question, but that's a really hard one. Um, it is It is very, it, it is really hard to estimate if you, um, and you can do this, um, on your computer as well, or if you're if your if your family you know has access to a computer, you can look at um, a lot of the back because she didn't just write letters to individuals; she also wrote these letters to her readers in her magazine, and she was writing from you know her foot. She wrote a couple stories before her first novel in 1827, and you know she wrote for decades um and if you look it would be actually it'd be a fun it would be a fun project to look at all the different um and i talk about these in the book all the different governors she wrote mm -hmm. so like you could look up how many how many states there were when she was alive and how many territories there were and you could figure it out you can figure it out for me i think mm -hmm. i think this is this sounds like a good this sounds like a good project do you do you like that somebody else giving you homework <laughs> um, that's a wonderful question. It's Thank you so much. Great. And it's really interesting. You can look at you can look at her, um, the Hathi Trust, H A T H I T R U S T. Joe, type that in the Joe or Sarah, somebody type that in the in the chat. Um, has scanned so many um, old magazines. You can actually look at them and you can see what they actually looked like. And in her, in many of her letters, she would talk about. The different governors and heads of territories that she wrote, which I think is, um, which I think is so interesting. And I mean, because you can do that. You, more people should write their uh, should write their representatives um, mm -hmm. about things they want to see happen in their community. And I think that's another great aspect of this book, especially for young people. Um, here was a woman who was not allowed to vote. So in this one respect, she had, you know, no voice, but she certainly found a way to communicate her voice. And I think that is a particularly inspirational message for, uh, for young people. She created a lane where there wasn't one, right? She, she That's created, right. yeah. Um, I think we might have time for one more. I love this question too. It's what's the most unusual Thanksgiving tradition you came across while doing research? Oh, huh. You know, okay, so there was a period of time and I have some letters from uh, concerned citizens that were mailed into, I think it was the New York Times, this one letter that I, that I quoted. Um, in the late 19th century and kind of, you know, even getting in a little bit into the 20th century, there were, um, there, were ma there was Halloween uh, Thanksgiving masking. So people on Thanksgiving Day, kids and even some adults would actually walk around on Thanksgiving Day with masks on of historical figures, political figures, and they would, um, and kids would dress up in kind of, some kids would dress up in what they called at the time ragamuffins, and they would run around and they would, they had like a ragamuffin parade, they called it at one point in New York, and they would walk up to strangers on the street with these masks or in these costumes and ask them for money or for treats. <laughs> and, um, and these weren't chilled, these weren't, you know, unhoused people who were actually needing these. This was just what you did on Thanksgiving. And it got to the point that a lot of stores were starting to put um, 
Thanksgiving, uh, Thanksgiving masks near the candy. Does this sound familiar at all? It sounds a little familiar. And then people, so there's this really funny letter that I, I quote in the book where this woman says, can we please do something about this tradition that has developed that I none of us like? I was accosted this many times walking down Sixth Avenue <laughs> by people asking me for money and blah, blah, blah in masks because it was Thanksgiving, you know, this this has to go away. And sure enough, that kind of shifted to- So how Halloween came, when, when did Halloween start? I mean, when did that- I haven't written that book yet, Kate. I know, it's not a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, this has been a lot of fun. And it I has been. Of yours, so. Thank, thank you so much. I'm gonna bring, um, I'm gonna bring Liz back on because I know she's gonna, she's gonna want to say uh, goodbye to everyone. But I, you know, I, I thank all of you so much for, um, for supporting the. Where is Liz? Here she is. I, I, you know, I thank all of you here uh, so much for supporting the National Women's History Museum, for supporting um, East City Bookshop and independent bookstores. Please keep independent businesses and bookstores in mind as we head into the holiday shopping season. Um, it, it, it really does make a difference. I'll, I'll shop small, help those, help those small businesses out. And thank you, Kate. This is hands down the weirdest uh, book tour I've ever had in my life and having people like you and places like the National Women's History Museum help me make it a little better and all you wonderful people who showed up to watch does make it so much uh, so much better so thank you to everyone. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you, Denise and Kate, very much for this wonderful conversation today. Thank you for taking some time out of your Sunday to be here with us today. Um, and for everybody who is here, if you've enjoyed this conversation, if you'd like to share this with your friends, we are recording this. We will have this on um, the National Women's History Museum website coming up, hopefully in the next few days. Mm -hmm. um, so please look out for that. Um, and as we gear up for Thanksgiving, that might look a little bit different than years past. Um, I just want to say from everybody at the National Women's History Museum, um, thank you for spending your Sunday with us and happy Thanksgiving. So thanks everyone. Thank happy you. Happy Thanksgiving everybody.